Well, there's power in the name. There's freedom in the name. Amen. There's joy in the name. Huh? Jesus gives us all. Amen. All right, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 28. Just in case you didn't remember that we're in Isaiah. Uh, 28, we're going to look at verses 5 and 6. And then I'm going to skip to 16 and 17. And then 23 through 29. Hear the word of the Lord. Isaiah 28, verses 5 and 6. Here it is again. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people and a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. Now going on to 16 and 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. And hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and waters will overwhelm the shelter. And then on to 23 through 29. Give ear and hear my voice. Give attention and hear my speech. Does he who plows for sowing plow continually? Does he continually open and harrow his ground? When he has leveled its surface, does he not scatter dill, sow cumin, and put in wheat in rows and barley in its proper place and emmer as the border? For he is rightly instructed. His God teaches him. Dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over cumin. But dill is beaten out with a stick and cumin with a rod. Does one crush grain for bread? No, he does not thresh it forever. When he drives his cartwheel over it with his horses, he does not crush it. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. Amen. Let's go to him in prayer. Father God, indeed, you are wonderful in counsel, excellent in wisdom. You are a sure foundation on which you are building this great building, your church, and changing us from within to be more like Christ. Now come, Holy Spirit, move among your people, move in the heart of your servant. Let us do what is pleasing in your sight. Let your name be glorified, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not just through the preaching of your word, but through the hearing of your word and the doing of your word. It's about you. It's all about you. You are our only reality. Remind us of that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, we have been talking about Isaiah and that Isaiah constantly pounds the theme that God reigns over the nations. He reigns over history. He reigns over flesh and blood. He therefore is the only one who can be trusted to fulfill his promises ultimately. Have the people of God learned this lesson from history? That's really what 28 is about. We know he reigns over history, but have his people learned that lesson to trust in him that he alone can save? In fact, in Isaiah 28, there are two audiences. One is Ephraim, which is really the northern kingdom. The other is Jerusalem, which represents the southern kingdom. Will the southern kingdom learn from what God is doing doing in the northern kingdom where he's bringing judgment because they have rejected him. Will they learn that lesson of history? 
Got to remember, it was 150 years of difference between the destruction of Samaria and the destruction of Jerusalem. But they did not learn. See, I'll skip to the end. I'll give you the spoil alert. They did not learn the lesson to trust in their God. Amen? So we see that. 28, 1 through 13, talks about what God is doing and will do to Ephraim in bringing judgment due to their pride. And because they believed that Aram would save them, they did not save them uh, against the Assyrians. And the question is, will Hezekiah learn the lesson that Egypt will not save the southern kingdom either? He, uh, in fact, so trusted in Egypt that he stopped giving tribute to the king of Assyria. And in fact, the king of Assyria came against Egypt, destroyed their army, and then came knocking on the door of Jerusalem, ready to say, you're not going to give me what I want. I'm going to take it. See what happens when we trust in human strength, when we trust in human wisdom instead of our God. So God says in this text, there is only one sure foundation, huh? And that is me. The only sure foundation for Zion, the only sure foundation for you and me is the Lord God. Let somebody say amen. Amen, amen and amen. Hmm. It says here that he's a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. Why? Because they'll wait on the Lord. See, those who believe wait on the Lord to move, right? Even when we don't understand what God is doing, we wait on the Lord. We don't understand what he's doing in our lives. We don't understand what he's doing in our family's lives, right? In our friends' lives, in our nation's life. We utterly ask constantly, why God? But those who believe, wait on the Lord for this answer. This answer is this. You can't learn to trust me until you're able to examine your pride and what you really have pride in. You will not learn to trust me until you ask the question, what message are you hearing that you think is from me? See? You will not learn to trust until you realize that God is saying, I'm going to do what I have to do in your life so that you learn to trust me. Hmm? Now, Ephraim and Manasseh sometimes look at a map of the tribes of Israel because Manasseh's land is huge compared to everybody else's. And Ephraim is a very fertile valley, right? It's, it, it, it grows uh, all this stuff that I like. Figs, dates, olives, grapes, right? Very fertile land. In fact, Isaiah calls it, and it's probably because they got this because they're the sons of Joseph, right? So they get this big land, this fertile land. And Isaiah calls this, and you look on verse one, he calls it a rich valley. Ephraim, a rich valley. Actually, in Hebrew, a valley of fatness, huh? Because it has all this richness. Now notice what he starts off with. He starts off with the word ah. Ah. Right? In Hebrew, whoa. Six times from chapter 28 to chapter 35, he says, whoa. Actually in Hebrew, hoy. What does it mean? If I were to put it in a modern vernacular, hey there, listen up. Because I got something to say. Right? So what's the warning? The warning is Ephraim, you th Ephraim, you think you're so beautiful. You think you got a crown on your head because Samaria is on a hilltop of the capital of your nation. But that beauty is about to fade. That crown that you think you ha have is coming off your head. Huh? That's what he's saying, because the Assyrians are coming. And isn't it interesting, how did the leaders and the people respond? They got drunk. They partied on the hilltops. 
And they drank until they could drink no more. In fact, they drank so much, they vomited. Now, this could be literal, it can be figurative, but really, I think it's both. Even though in 733, the Assyrians were already showing that they're about to punish Ephraim, the northern kingdom, but did that stop them from partying? No, because they thought their beauty would never end. They thought their luxury would never end. Huh? Oh, boy. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? Huh? Right? They thought their lifestyle, their wonderful luxury would never end. So they wore their crown of pride on their head. They thought their rich valley was a victor's wreath, a diadem, a crown. Now, does anybody have seen pictures of the fires that went in Maui? Did anybody see those? Really look at before and after pictures of what happened in Hawaii because of the fires. If you can look at those pictures, that's what happened with Ephraim. Same concept. Utter destruction. Because God's wrath came upon them. I think it's the historical town of Lahaina uh, in Hawaii, uh, in Maui, that most got hit. And if you look at those pictures, it's sad to look at the devastation and the loss of life because of those fires. And Isaiah is giving you in this text a before and after picture of what's going to happen to the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes, because of their rejection of God. See, can I put it in plain language? God don't play. He don't play. You don't want him, then you're going to get what happens when you don't want him. Huh? Because there is no life apart from him. There is no hope apart from him. There is no joy apart from him. Right? See, God shows what happens when we trust in human strength. What happens when we run after other salvations? Will we come out of the lesson seeing what a great savior our God is? When things happen in our lives, will we see when our culture fails us that it is God's salvation that we should be longing for? Will we see we were wrong to think, to say maybe, to act maybe, that trusting in God is a bad risk? Hmm? Will we see that When we are controlled by fear, we cannot see the all-sufficiency of God. So long as we are controlled by fear. Hmm? We can't rest in it. Do we only feel truly safe and rich when trusting God? Does the mess of our lives rule us? Or does Jesus rule us? And the only way we know the answers to these questions is how we live our lives determines who we're really trusting in. Human strength, human wisdom, or the Lord our God. Can somebody say amen? See, God always gives hope in the midst of our foolish decisions in life, doesn't he? Now, when we trust in human strength, look at verses five and six. What it says there is, it's not Ephraim that's going to wear a crown. It's the Lord our God who wears a crown. It is a diadem, right? It is a crown of beauty and glory. All in that day, in that day, all will see. When that trumpet blast blows, all will see who really wears the crown, who really is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he is the one who brings life forevermore, right? He is the one who is the one who is of justice and righteousness. He is the one who gives victory for his people at the enemy's gate. He pushes the enemy back because he is the divine warrior for his people. Do you remember 26.8? Look over there. 26.8, Isaiah 26.8. I read this to you before. In the path of your judgments, O Lord, we wait for you. Your name and remembrance are the desire 
of our soul. And when we fail to trust in God and we trust rather in human strength, here's what happens. We start trusting in human wisdom. And that fails too. Human wisdom fails. You just heard it in 1 Corinthians about the cross is foolishness, right? To the unbeliever, you know what it is? It is that human wisdom sees the message of God as childish. It's overly simplistic. Right? That's what the people of Israel and Judah were saying. And by the way, it wasn't just the political leaders who were saying this. It was the spiritual leaders who were saying this, that Isaiah's message was childish, foolishness, overly simplistic. Trust God? That's it? That's all you're going to say? That he always fulfills his promises? You've got to be kidding me. With the Assyrians at our door? Trust God. Thanks for that, Isaiah. Tell me, what hope is there for a nation? Listen to me. What hope is there for a nation when both their political and spiritual leaders mock God's message? Hmm? And give themselves over to debauchery, to sin, and excuse it. See, the people of Israel and Judah prefer the words and visions of drunken prophets and priests because they tell them what they want to hear. No wonder they make bad decisions. Hmm? Leading to destruction. By the way, just a history lesson, right? Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. You know why he was against putting in God we trust on the money? He was a Dutch reformed. And you know why? Because he said it was a sacrilege to equate God and money. Where have we come in our nation from that? I just had to throw that history lesson in there. Okay? Come on. So their response was either Isaiah, your words, this is the first complaint, our baby talk, mere milk, it's not sophisticated enough. And here's one other problem we got. Why don't you ever give us any pleasant messages? You're only talking about judgment, right? Which, by the way, isn't true because he constantly brought in hope. But all they heard, boy, is this coming to today. All they heard was judgment. You know, it was interesting that Martin Luther, and this is just the first complaint, about his preaching. But Martin Luther said, when I preach, he said, I preach not to the doctor or magistrate. He had 40 of them in his congregation. But to the servants' maids and to children. And if the doctors and the magistrates don't like it, the door is open. Boy, do we need courage like that in our preachers. You don't like what I preach? There's the door. Huh? If it's the word of God, all you need to say is amen. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Huh? Amen? Here's the other thing. When they heard the word of the Lord from Isaiah's mouth, their response was, blah, blah, blah. We've heard it all before. Right? On he goes. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Here a little, there a little. What they don't hear is the message that the Holy One of Israel is a sure foundation. Huh? He's a cornerstone holding us up in the day of trouble. No, they say, how dare you, Isaiah, call our indulgences sin? How dare you? And how dare you 
get on us for a sensible arrangement with Egypt, our wonderful neighbor, to help us against the Assyrians. No, it is not our talk that is foolish. It is your talk that is foolish. Your talk that says to trust God, to trust that he can stop the Assyrians, that he can stop the Babylonians. It's you who is foolish in telling us to trust in the Holy One of Israel. I love this text. I'm going to recite it again. It is Isaiah 30. Look at it, 10 through 11. Boy, if, if this is not a message for our day of what people think of preaching. Do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Do you know what people want today in preaching? Motivational speakers. That's what they want. They don't want anybody to talk about what really is going on in our lives and where we need to repent and turn in faith again to Jesus Christ. Don't you dare talk to us about that. Huh? I'm just saying it plain. But here's one thing they're right about. The gospel is simple. Isn't it? Isn't the gospel simple? It says that all people are estranged from God because of sin. That sin brings physical death and brings eternal death. Right? But God's desire is, right? His desire is that you receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6, 23. The other one was Romans 3, 23. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. Simple message. We receive this gift of eternal life by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and not by works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We exercise faith by repenting of our sin and accepting what Christ has done through his sacrifice. The forgiveness of our sins and purifying us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. By confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we are saved. Romans 10, 9 through 10. Therefore, we can live a new life imitating Jesus Christ because we are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Simple. Our old self was crucified with Christ, therefore we no longer are slaves to sin. Romans 6, 6. Don't you see the foundation of the church is not its history or tradition. The foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. The foundation of the church is to turn from sin and turn in faith to Jesus Christ this day. For today is the day of salvation. You may not have tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Turn, repent, Turn to Christ and know what it means to have eternal life. Can somebody say amen? That's the simple gospel message. How can it be more simple than that? Too simple? No. He is the only way of salvation. In fact, he is the only reality. Because he is the only one who can make the lost found, the weak, Strong. Come on. Isn't it? Isn't it true? The foolish wise leading us to delight more in him than all the world's treasures combined. Hmm? So we need to see that the message is simple. I like what Raymond Ortland Jr. puts, how he puts it in his sermon on this text. That is when we see through the world's deception and nothingness, and when our hearts prize Christ above all. That's when a spirit of justice and strength empowers us to bring into the world the only true good that exists. Do you understand that? Do you understand that we have the only true good, the message that saves people from eternal death? Do you understand that? Because if we really did understand that, we would be telling people, everybody that we see, the gospel, the simple gospel. 
So they repent and believe. Because it is the only good. Hmm? You know, here's the second thing. What are we hearing? See, what were the people of Isaiah's day hearing when they heard the word of God? See? Think about this. How much do you hear the word of God over the messages of the world? Oh my goodness. We have a mental health crisis because people, all they know is social media. All they hear is the opinions of others. How much are they hearing what God is saying? Some people say, well, God is so elusive. Where is he? I can't hear him. Well, no wonder. You drown him out. You drown out the message of God. You know, people say, well, I hear movies. You know why I go through media and stuff like that? Because I want to say how foolish you are. How foolish to think such things. You know, like there's going to be a federation. One world. One hope. Give me a break. We can't even get out of our own way. The hope is in the Lord God. Come on. Isn't that true? Tell me something. When you hear the word of God, what do you hear? Blah, blah, blah. When you hear the word of God, are you overjoyed? Or are you annoyed? Hmm? Overjoyed about what God has done? Do you see when you hear the word of God? I never realized how much the word of God speaks to my life and how I'm going to, I should live my life and how Christ has saved me? Or are you annoyed? Why all the time do we talk about sin and repentance and grace and salvation? Why do we always talk about these same things? Where's the hope? Isn't that hope that Christ saves? So you don't want that? You want to be annoyed with that? Well, look what Isaiah says to his nation about that. Chapter 28, verses 11 and 12. Look there. For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to his people, to whom he has said, this is rest, give rest to the weary, and this is repose, yet they would not hear. God is saying, you don't want my rest? You think what I'm saying is unintelligible? Well, let me tell you something. Your conquerors in their language is going to be unintelligible to you. You won't be able to speak it. You will not be able to understand it. I gave you a word that you could understand. You didn't want that. So I'll give you a word you will not understand. Except for the destruction that it will bring. You think my words are unintelligible, unhopeful? Wait until you hear the language of your conquerors. Isn't it interesting that this text, Isaiah 28, 12, is used by Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 when he says, you want tongues that is for the unbeliever. You don't want prophecy that is for the believer. He quotes this text. You don't want the straight word of God. You just want excitement or something that makes you look spiritual. But you don't want the word of God that changes your heart. See, that's the danger when we only seek gifts rather than the Lord himself. Hmm. See, the message of God is clearer, more simple than any message from life or from the world. It's quite simple. Did Judah learn from Ephraim's history, trusting in Ram rather than God? We already t told you no. Hey, King Ahaz, remember, made a mistake in thinking that Assyria was going to be his savior when Assyria became his tyrant. 
And did Judah learn? No, they trusted in Egypt, although Hezekiah would repent. And so God sent an angel, killed 185,000 Assyrians like that. That's what happens when you trust in the Lord and you're worrying about your enemies. He sends one angel, (laughs) wipes out 185,000. Huh? So what did Judah do? What did their leaders, their spiritual and political leaders, they did not only not listen to the word and say it was unintelligible, but they said they scoffed at it. They actually scoffed at it, right? Do you know that scoffing in the Old Testament is the last degree of ungodliness? That's what the political and spiritual leaders of Judah were doing. And they said, no, our covenant of life is with the Egyptians. And God says, it's going to be a covenant of death. It's going to be Sheol from the grave. You think the Egyptians are going to be your refuge? That refuge is a lie. That's what's going to happen. You know your houses and your lives are going to be like what Jesus said when the fool built his house upon the sand and the floods came. Huh? Look at, look at verse 20. This is a great passage. Verse 20. What is he basically saying in there about the bed? He's saying, you made your bed, now lie in it. What's going to happen? You think you're going to get rest from the bed that you have made? Guess what? Your bed is going to be too short and your blanket is going to be too narrow. You have, have you ever been in a bed like that? I've slept in a bed with my three other brothers going crossways. Yeah, we pull. Come on. You know. And I didn't get any rest. Come on. You think you can escape because your ancestors escaped in 705 because Hezekiah repented? You're not going to escape because in 586 BC, the Babylonians are coming. Think about this of the lies we listen to. We listen to a lot of lies. Right? People are basically good. I'll tell you something. You will never hear the gospel so long as you believe that. People are not basically good. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Come on. That's what the truth is. And that's why we need Jesus. Come on. Right? I cannot help what I do. It's in my DNA. What? How about this one? It's due to my culture. It's due to my race. It's due to my generation. It's due to my ethnicity. It's just the way I am. Oh, and by the way, it's my Christian freedom. To indulge this way. It is easy for us to find excuses for our sins by excusing them as personality traits. I like what Tim Chester says what the heart desires, the mind justifies. Huh? Yet again, the Lord brings hope. He always brings hope in the midst of of disaster. Though Judah's covenant with Egypt puts them again under slavery, God again will bring an exodus. He is a good God. God will defeat his people's enemies like he did for King David at Baal Perazim. Right? In 2 Samuel 5 20, David said the Lord broke through his enemies, the Philistines, like a breaking flood. Isaiah says the Lord again will deliver his people like he did at Gibeon when Joshua went against the Amorites on behalf of the Gibeonites in Joshua 10. God rained hailstones from heaven, killing more Amorites than Israel did by the sword. Don't go against his redeemed. God is a loving father with a heavy heart at times, must discipline his children. His rebellious children. But his aim is not destruction. It is restoration. It is healing. It's renewing. Right? Isn't that true? Let me compare it to our nursery remodeling. 
right? There's got to be some demolition until there's rebuilding, right? When I did the stairs off my deck, me and others had at first demolish before we could build. God is saying, I'm laying a foundation, not just for the church, but in your life. And I have done some demolition and I'm going to do a little bit more while I'm building on this one foundation, Jesus Christ, to conform you to the image of him. I got to do some demolition. I got to do some rebuilding. Huh? You see it? It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. But watch this, how he ends. He ends with a parable. The parable of the farmer. Learn from the farmer, he says. In the last verses here. The farmer knows how to prepare the ground, right? He has to till the ground. The ground is hard, but he has to till it in order to plant, right? And when he plants, what does he do? And by the way, he doesn't plow continually, does he? He plows for a while, plants, waters, lets it grow, harvest. There's different steps. No step is forever. Uh, yeah, you're getting the image of what he's saying now. When he plants, he plants wheat in a different place. Then he does dill and cumin. Why? Because he's doing different things in your life. He's planting different things in your life to build trust, to, to look to him and to totally look to him. He's going to use many different means, many different plants in your life in order to build that trust. Phew, I'm getting worn out. Right? And here's the thing. Other people say, well, it's simple common sense. Right? Even the farmer knows how to farm. And even when he doesn't believe in God, Yet, he said, you know, he knows what to do. Well, who gave common sense? Huh? Right? See, we often undermine the concept of common grace. God gives people, you know, societies know they cannot survive if they can. And by the way, this is our problem. If you continually give a nation to crime, adultery, murder, stealing without punishment, that nation will fall. Everybody knows that. You go, well, how do they know that? Because God wrote it on their conscience. He wrote the commandments on their conscience because all are made in his image. Right? So come on, man. You know this stuff. And here's the thing. What we do not receive by faith, he will teach us by life experiences. And if you have faith for yesterday, let me tell you something. That don't work for today. You got to have learn and build faith for today, not just yesterday. When the farmer threshes, right? Dill, he does not do it with a threshing sledge. In other words, God constantly, what he's doing in your life, he knows the exact things to use to bring the harvest, to bring what he's seeking. He does not roll over cumin with a threshing stone or cartwheel, it's called, right? This big stone. He breaks dill with a stick and cumin with a rod. See, the farmer knows. The farmer doesn't even thresh wheat seed forever to make bread. He stops after a while. He's not going to constantly plow in your life. He's not going to constantly plant in your life. He, he's, he, even when he harvests, he's going to bring it to the glorious end that he desires. You just got to wait on him. Trust in him. Just like the farmer knows when to plow, sow, harvest, prepare the desire end. That's our God. We are where we are in our lives because God designed it to be so. And look, what he uses in my life to build trust is not the same thing he's going to use in your life to uh, learn to trust him. It's going to be different. You may have a harder path than I have. Though sometimes that's a little hard to believe. But Right? Trust God. Because, see, he always has the right touch for each of us. He knows how to exactly work in our lives in each of those stages and how long to plow, how long to plant, how long to harvest to produce his glorious end for us. God always fights for those who trust him. Trust him. Too simple, but it's the truth. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Let it pierce our hearts. Let us be a people who trust in you. And I repent for so many times I haven't. So many times your people haven't. 
No matter how many times you've shown us, we can trust in you. Forgive us. But again, renew in us this faith, this simple faith, the trust in you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.